Welcome to our 10th and final lesson in our study on the book of Galatians. Um, we are back tonight for this last lesson, and we're going to cover the last half of chapter 6. Um, and then we'll do some kind of, you know, looking back through the book, to solidify it in our minds a little bit so that we can um, just, you know, remember what it's about and re revisit the major themes of the book. So um, let's uh, review from the first half of chapter six. What, what was the first half of chapter six about? About correcting your brothers gently with love. Right. And not yeah, following Yeah, yeah. What word did it use rather than correct? <laughs> Restore. Restore. And I wonder if, you know, maybe that's a significant, um, maybe mental transition that, we, you know, when we're thinking about a person, thinking about restoration, like making new, making, establishing wellness is the goal for that. Yeah. So we talked about all of that next week. And I think you mentioned with gentleness, that idea of um, gentleness being one of the ways the spirit comes out in the life of the, the person who sows to the spirit. Yeah. What else? Be careful of being tempted and carry, carry each other's burdens. Yeah. So who had the most cautions to, to being careful? Who has to be careful? Teacher. The teacher. Yeah. The one who ha is trying to restore. So the one who has made the false step is, you know, told to, to appreciate the help, help in getting back, but the, all those cautions, be careful lest you be tempted. They go to the person who's trying to restore. And so we see, you know, how serious that is and how difficult it is. And it is just difficult to live in community that is at the level of depth where we're in each other's business, right? Yeah. What else? Anything else stand out to you? Someone mentioned we bear one another's burdens. So that was part of it. You know, we saw the sort of the, the balance between um, each, bear one another's burdens and each one should carry his, his own load. And so we get like that the life and community is both inward and outward. And we both support each other and examine ourselves. And those are both part of our life together. Yeah, we were also supposed to, as the person being corrected or brought to restoration, they're supposed to share the blessings that they've received with the teacher. Yeah. Yeah, an interesting idea, isn't it? And maybe challenging, challenging on both sides. Yeah, the thing, I, the, the part of this passage that I love is this idea of like, look, do not be deceived. You, can, you can't actually make a fool of God. You actually can't do it. I'm not telling you not to do it. You can't do it because reality has the results that reality has, right? You sow to the, to the flesh, it's destructive behavior and you reap the resulting destruction. That, that's how it works. The good news side of that is you sow to the spirit. The spirit will not fail to bring about the goodness that comes from sowing the spirit in your life. You know, that is something, a promise that I, that we can count on from God, that, um, that, that investment in a life in the spirit will um, reward us with love and joy and peace and patience, those characteristics that, that grow like fruit in our lives. And it doesn't mean it's easy, but it does mean that God is reliable in that way. Yeah. All right. Anything else? He ends with an instruction to persevere, right? Don't become weary in doing good, right? It's not easy. It's going to take perseverance. So um, keep doing good. 
And now we come to the postscript. So let's read Galatians 6, 11 through 15, if someone would pick that up. I'll read it. Thank you. See what large letters I use as I write to you with my own hand. Those who want to impress people by means of the flesh are trying to compel you to be circumcised. The only reason they do this is to avoid being persecuted for the cross of Christ. Not even those who are circumcised keep the law, yet they want you to be circumcised so that they may boast about your circumcision in the flesh. May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What counts is the new creation. Thank you. Oh, you know what? Actually, go ahead and finish um, all the way to the end of the chapter through 18. We'll talk about moving the ball. I, did, I, did I say something different? I'm you sorry. said 15. Oh, that That's was, fine. I just misspoke. <laughs> <laughs> Peace and mercy to all who follow this rule, to the Israel of God. From now on, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers and sisters. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you. Okay. So um, we're back to, uh, so we've covered that. We did this passage. I don't know if you remember. We did it briefly when we did the whole overview of the book, looking for like, what is going on with Paul and these opponents? And we saw that it was really all, you know, pointing towards this issue of circumcision, right? And so we, we looked at this passage when we did that. But now we're going to look at it in terms of how we're tying up these themes that we've studied across the book and how the, the actual content of it is all coming together, right? So um, we're back to see what large letters I use as I write with my own hand. Can you? Aaron's laughing. What are you thinking? It makes me think about how the scribes probably write and they like little tiny like engineering writing or scientific writing. And, you know, Paul probably not writing all the time is like, you know, like beginner yeah. writing. He, he likes to use the big chief, the big chief notepad. <laughs> right. Like the, the little, uh, the elementary, like with the dots in the middle. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a great way to think about it because this is what we're seeing is the result of like literacy was reading, writing was a craft, right? An art and a craft that you hired someone to do. So the rest of this has been written by a scribe. And why is why is Paul writing now? I mean this. This is this is really from me. Really from me, right? This is like we would sign it with our signature is authenticated he the their habit is to write the last paragraph and that authenticates the letter it is a signature but it's a whole paragraph worth of signature when you think about it um is probably a better authentication than just the signature right i mean can't you um spot your mom's or your sister's or your brother's you know handwriting and you know it immediately um, which is the signature may be distinctive, but sometimes you're like, did someone just scribble that? I'm just not sure. Um, and so that whole handwriting is his way of authenticating it. Um, and then also he's, he sort of, he does a double thing, right? First he says, I'm authenticating this letter. This is really for me. But he also says, I'm making a show of it, but the people who want to be circumcised are just making a show out of their faith right he follows it up with those who want to make a good impression outwardly right those people um that that phrase is literally those who want to make a good showing in the flesh what was their good showing in the flesh circumcision circumcision right so he's saying he's comparing it he's saying i'm making a show of signing this myself they're making out of show of out of their whole faith trying to make circumcision this badge of piety to cover up that they're trying to get out of persecution so why why would persecution come in here we talked about this but um it, the, it it's been some weeks so if anyone can refresh our memory why would persecution come into it well don't the jews have a special dispensation that they don't have to to 
um, worship the Greek gods. And the Christians don't fit in with the Jews, but the Romans think they're the same thing. And it's all getting a little muddy and confusing. All going to get messed up. They're going to bring the whole ta- house of cards down. Yeah, so the, the Jews have a special dispensation not to worship the Roman emperor. This was a deal they made with Julius Caesar way back when they helped um, Julius sort of in the Civil War where he came to power. Um, and it was out of a time where they had been, where the emperors were trying to make them um, worship the emperor participate in the imperial cult um, worship of Caesar and they just wouldn't do it. And it was just such a problem and they were torturing and killing a lot of Jews. And so the, the, the um, compromise is that the Jews would pray for the emperor rather than to the emperor, but Hey, the Jews are easy to identify because they're circumcised and you, if they go to the bathhouse, you know, you know, that person is not a Jew because they're not circumcised. And so this idea is like the Christians to kind of start not worshiping the emperor and claiming it was because they're worshiping the God of Israel alone. But meanwhile, they're not circumcised, so they're not Jews. And so everything that the Jews really feel that their deal is precarious here. And that it could, you know, the house of cards, right? So great memory, thank you. And that, you know, this avoidance of persecution, Paul says, is not a good reason. He says that is not how we um, decide whether to do something or not. He says we're we're going to rely on our faith in Jesus. And Paul says that persecution will, in fact, come. And so he kind of wraps up this theme of flesh versus spirit by saying no showing in the flesh. You don't get to make a showing in the flesh. Um, He says, not even those who are circumcised obey the whole law, but they want you so that they may boast about your flesh. No, no, they're circumcised. It's fine. He says, no, that's not okay. And then verse 14 what does Paul say is really grounds for boasting? I'm trying to place it, but wasn't it Jesus Christ? Yes, and specifically. Cross. Um, this is verse 14. Yeah, the cross. Exactly. So, right, this is. This is, we're back to the upside down kingdom as Jesus preached it and lived it, right? Because the cross is an offense is how Paul describes it in 511. The cross is a mark of shame, of the condemnation of society, right? This is an instrument of torture. But for Jesus followers, it becomes something completely opposite, right? It's this upside down nature that you would boast that their glory comes in reliance on God in the midst of shame. And so he says, my boasting is, would, you know, it would only be ever in the cross of Christ. And so we get this sort of, um, you know, he, he comes out of that saying through which I have been crucified to the world. Um, I, I have, let's see, the world has been crucified to me and I to the world, right? So it it's a thematic statement that we've seen sort of in three versions before, right? Remember, if we go back to 219, um, that's the passage where Paul gives that pre-summary. Um, it, it's the end of his conversation with Peter, and he says it's, it tells us what he's about to un, unpack. And he says, um, I have been crucified with Christ, and yet not I live, but Christ lives in me. And we saw, oh, two lessons ago, I think, how that was parallel to 524, where he says the follower has crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And now we see like the third a sort of version of this same statement, right? Where it's um, I to the the crucified to the world and um, the world to me and I to the world. So we get that repetition of this idea of 
the Jesus follower doesn't make the small sacrifice of the flesh, right? The circumcision, a cutting of the flesh, but a sacrifice of entire life and being, right? This, this crucified whole life so that Christ lives in me. Questions or comments on that? We've seen sort of these these same little themes. The way he's like he's like weaving every one of them in as he as he builds to the conclusion here. He wraps that up with the final verdict on circumcision. What is the verdict on circumcision? Verse fifteen. Being a new creation. Yeah, being a new creation is what matters. What doesn't matter? What does he say? Circumcision makes no difference. Yeah, circumcision or uncircumcision. He says neither one matter. Now, what does he mean by neither one matter? They're not required of the new covenant. Right, they're not required. Now, will um, the Jews still be circumcised? Yeah, probably. Yeah. I and mean, Paul, the ones that are obviously will be, but, you know, yes. probably will also their sons. Right. So it will continue to be a cultural practice among the Jews. He's not, he said, he, that's fine, right? Paul is circumcised. I mean, we assume because he wouldn't not be, right? Um, yeah, so this idea that like they don't matter, but do they not matter in a way that it's so that if the Galatian Gentiles decide they want to go get circumcised, well, that would be fine? Yeah, remember in the first half of chapter five, I, heard, I saw shaking of heads, no, I'll say for the audio, but he says um, five, three. Uh, or a five two. If you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. So it's this idea that, like, no, they don't matter. But if you go do it, that's a sign that you're showing it matters, right? So he is saying they don't matter, but not in a way that would be okay for them to go do. <laughs> it does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Well, it shows that they're trying to be justified by the law, and that's not the covenant anymore yeah it's not something that you would do without it mattering right it's it's a it's a meaningful change and he says if you do it you are obligated to the whole law and in the end neither one matters but what matters is a new creation what do you think paul means by new creation Well, he, he, he's alluding to the Holy Spirit in people's hearts, isn't he? Yeah, yeah, I think so. That idea of the life of the Spirit. Um, back in 608, he says, from the Spirit will reap the eternal type of life. So yeah, the life of the Spirit is new and you with it are a new creation together with the Spirit. Yeah, what else? And we have that idea. Well, go ahead, Bethany. Uh, I was just going to say, I mean, you do have this new influx of believers that are not Jews. So there's that aspect as well. Yeah. So individually, you know, I, you know, each one I've been brought into Abraham's family. I am now a descendant of Abraham spiritually, spiritually a descendant of Sarah as the free woman. Um, I've received the Holy Spirit as the down payment on all of that promise of blessing. But then together, Jew and Gentile are part of the new 
body of Christ, right? The new multi-ethnic family of believers is a new creation as well. That family of God did not exist without Jesus dying on the cross to bring them together and to bring the blessing to all. And so that, that, that part of the new creation is each individual Christian as a new, a new person in the spirit and the body as a whole is a new creation together, that community of faith where we can be Jew and Gentile, male and female, slave and free, and yet unified in Jesus. And so it's sort of, it's, it's in some way, this statement is the culmination of everything that he has been teaching as he's gone through the whole story, right? It's, Abraham's blessing, it's you rece receiving the Holy Spirit, it's living together in community. So it all sort of ties in. Thoughts, comments? We see that Paul signs off with peace and mercy in verse 16 and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, verse 18. Um, he wishes these upon the Israel of God. Who do you think he means by the Israel of God? The new family. The new family, right? This is how all of these concepts are coming together, right? The Israel of God is the spiritual Israel, the Jews and the Gentiles, who by trusting God have become a part of the family of God. Yeah, in Jesus, definitely. And then the last part of his sign up, his sign off, you know, he's back to authenticating his apostleship. He never kind of quits doing that, right? Um, he says, let no one cause me trouble. Why? This is verse 17. He bears the marks of Jesus on his body. Yeah. So not the circumcision of the flesh. That's not what he's talking about. What is he talking about? What are the marks of Jesus he bears on his body? Being whipped. The scars of persecution as his, this, the, his being crucified with Christ has been literal suffering in body, hasn't it? And he says, that's what it looks like to have some kind of mark for Jesus, not circumcision, but the marks of um, sharing your faith in, in, in persecution, right? And um, so that kind of, it, that ties up, you know, this last little post script, I think when I first read it, I was like, okay, it's kind of a random collection of thoughts. But when we dig in, you know, we see he's really, he's, he's bringing it all home, isn't he? Yeah. So let's look kind of across the book, right? We've talked about how Galatians is kind of hard to really get the like, yeah, I've got a handle on Galatians. Yeah. Oh, well, that's hard to do, isn't it? So um, let's look section by section. I sent out um, a couple of, you know, like I think five, yeah, five separate sections to look at it. And so let's think about what each section says. Um, let's start with Galatians 1. Do you want, should I put this on like a little whiteboard or should we just do it verbally? Which one? I saw a nodding, but I don't know which it was nodding for which which option. <laughs> I, I was saying the whiteboard. The whiteboard. Okay, let's do it. Open the whiteboard then. How's that? Did it work? All right. We have a whiteboard. Okay. What is this first section is Galatians 1, 1 through 10. So it's really just the opener. What, what does this part say? It's authenticating uh, Paul's authority 
as equal to the Jewish leaders. Okay. So, and where does that, where does that start? Like the body of that part start? It's in the first. Um, yeah. The first verse. <laughs> yeah. The first verse. He does. He, he pre-mentions it in the first verse, but he doesn't super get into it. Um, he's like, so look at the, so the first verse, Yes, definitely mentioning because Paul's like that, right? He's going to always preview some things and then he'll do them and then he'll wrap them up. It's the, you know, kind of classic communication method, right? Um, but you notice that he doesn't really like hit it hard till 111. I want you to know, brothers, the gospel I preach you is not something man made up, right? And then he goes from there. So I'm going to put that in, in B, starting at 111. Um, what, it won't let me type in the same thing once I go away from it? Ah, no, you just have to be smarter than the program, maybe. No. I'm not smarter than the program, I guess. There you go. I'll still try it. Okay. Um, so all about Paul's apostleship. You know what I think? It's just... Okay, bear with me one moment. We're just going to not get out of that like I did so that I can keep editing because otherwise I won't have room. Okay, Paul's apostleship. He really makes a point to authenticate it. Why? What is the point of his authenticating his apostleship? To what end? Well, he wants it to be clear that he is separate from the leaders and that what has been given to him is from God, from Jesus, but that the leaders of the Jewish community agree. Yeah. Jerusalem is not the boss of him, but they agree with him. And what do they agree with him about? Like, what is the main point that they agree with him about? We can find this in, say, uh, 2, 15 and 16. We who Jews by birth and not gentle, Gentile sinners. He's talking to Peter, but he's going to tell you the thing that we all agree on. What is it? They're not justified by the law. Right. But by what? Faith. Belief. In? Jesus. In Jesus, right. Not justified by the law, but by faith in Jesus. Absolutely. So that's the kind of the point of his gospel. So in authenticating his apostleship, what he's aiming at is is establishing that he is giving them the true gospel right so in this is this first little section this is his greeting and what else what is his main thing that he says um in addition to his greeting he's astonished he's astonished so quickly yeah. deserted yeah don't desert the gospel Right. If the, if the letters to stop them from doing what they're about to do. Right. So mm -hmm. it's don't desert the gospel. That's his desert. How do you spell dessert that is not food, but is not the sandy desert? It says know. deserting and it's like the desert in the book. Okay. So it must be. OK, don't desert the gospel. OK, don't. And that's kind of like he. So. He's like, hi, don't desert the gospel, right? So the the greeting is that hard hitting, like we need an intervention moment here, isn't it? And then he goes into, he authenticates his apostleship 
for the purpose of saying the gospel I've given you is the true gospel. And the reason it matters that Jerusalem is not the boss of him, but they agree with him is because Jesus gave him this message. Jesus himself gave Paul this message. And the message is we're made right with God, justified, made right with God by faith in Jesus Christ. Yeah. So I think that kind of captures what um, that section, anything to, else in that um chapter you know most of chapter one and chapter two section well if you think of something shout it out what's what's in chapter three what's chapter three about Chapter three is about justification through faith. Right, because who who is the father of that? Abraham. Abraham, right? So they are, and they. What's their relationship now to Abraham? Their descendants. Yeah, they get the seed exactly right. Um, they're the sons of and daughters of Abraham. By faith, as you said, right? By this um, trusting Jesus. Faith in Jesus, or as it says in chapter 2, by the faithfulness of Jesus, right? They are children of Abraham by faith in Jesus, right? And what else is in chapter 3? That we're children of God. Yeah, yeah. And um, what uh, what was the purpose of the law? It was our guardian until Christ came. Yes, exactly. So we get we got to be children of the law of God through the blessing of Abraham. The law just brought us there, right? The law was to lead us to Christ. That was the purpose of the law. And he also talks about how, um, look at verse uh, 14. He redeemed us in order that the, uh, this is 314. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus. So this is like the, the redemption of God was to bring the Jews and Gentiles together, right? So the blessing might come. The Jews had the blessing, but now he's also brought the blessing to the Gentiles. Okay, what's in, do um, you suppose if I leave this, I will be able to get it back. Let's try it. Okay, what's in chapter four? they get into the slave versus free and don't enslave yourself to the law again and Abraham and Sarah and it gets a little muddy for me well and I think um that I that, but I think you've captured the essence really really well Christ set you free don't go back to slavery so um he this is where we do the whole um Sarah is the free woman, Hagar is the slave woman, and he says, you're 
children of freedom. And you, both Jews and Gentiles, right? It's not, this isn't physical descent, but spiritual descent. You, Jews and Gentiles, who trust in Jesus are children of the free woman, right? Um, your inheritance is freedom. So that, that, um, so that his analogy sort of threads through and says, Christ set you free and made you what what are they what is what are they also um where's a good verse for this how about um four seven the adopted children of christ of god and his children and heirs, right? That's idea of heirs was so important because what you're inheriting is the promise and the down payment on the promise is what? What is the down payment on the promise? A relationship with Christ? Yeah, yeah. And, and that happens through verse six because you are sons god sent what the spirit yeah so the spirit is the first part of that inheritance right in other books god calls the spirit the down payment on the full inheritance to come so this idea of the inheritance begins with the spirit of god in our hearts so that we can cry out abba father that relationship exactly yeah and then five and six i put those together um because what kind of material do we have in five and six it's kind of warnings about not getting circumcised because it's meaningless and basically how to live as a christian Right. Um, living by the spirit, right? This is this is the practical section. Exactly. He says, so let's wrap it all up. And this is what your life should look like in the spirit. Um, what what would you say is the summation for what it should look like to live by the spirit? Love your neighbor as yourself. Yeah. Exactly. And so fulfill the law of Christ. The law of Christ is summed up in a single command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Right. So that idea of don't use your freedom. We're, we're in verse um, 13 is where that comment led me. Um, don't use your freedom to indulge the flesh, but be slaves to one another in love. Right. So not by flesh, but um, in love. Right. And because of that, that, you know, this is, is is that idea of walking by the spirit because we live by the spirit. Let us keep in step with the spirit. That whole the the way it all plays out in real life on a day to day basis is by loving your neighbor as yourself. Yeah. Other comments on what we found in Galatians. Well, we have the fruits of the spirit. Yeah, that is, I think, probably the most well-known verse in Galatians. And as we um, sort of put all of this content together, we can see how it all really points to this idea that when we are crucified with Christ, when we live by the spirit, we sow to the spirit, this is the fruit that blossoms in our life. We become the kind of person that we ourselves would want to be around. That it's not sowing to destruction, but sowing to this production, this healthy 
um, way of living as a best self, I guess we could say, or as a, a best human being, the best way to live as a human being. Anything else sound out to you? We can really see our themes that um, we started with in what we've done here. So um, does anyone have the themes we started with handy? Because I have them handy and I can read them out. <laughs> yeah, so the first one we had said was um, Paul defends his apostleship, right? So we see that he, I mean, he really spent almost two chapters doing that, right? And it's because like for us, the good news of all that is this, um, this idea of we can in fact trust the gospel. So, uh, I wonder if I can do a highlighty thing. I don't know. No, that's just a, obviously I don't know how to use this program very well. <laughs> Nope, that made a new thing. Sad times. Hmm. Okay, so that true gospel there, right? What else? I did, I underlined a thing. <laughs> okay, the second one um, was that we are justified or made right by God why right with god how through faith yeah not by law but by faith in jesus christ and a lot of whoa that was bad underlining a lot of times you will hear galatians summed up with the idea of we're saved not by works but by faith so don't try to earn your salvation just believe it's not a very good summary of what Galatians is doing, is it? Instead, what we see is like, oh yeah, all the works are, you're still expected, the works are there. They just flow out of you by the power of the spirit. It's all about trusting Jesus first, right? And we really see that. So we, we see how if you came to, to the idea of coming to Jesus with a legalistic sort of like, I have to check these boxes, you could read Galatians and tell that it doesn't work that way. But the way that it, the Galatians unfolds is he's, you know, is really that focus on trusting Jesus and trusting in the faithfulness of Jesus and your works flow out of that. Yeah. And then the third theme um, was like Jews and Gentiles are heirs of the promise together. And so we see how that came out, you know, in this idea of like Jesus died to, to put to bring the promise to the Gentiles. But we also see it now like you're all Jews and Gentiles are also spiritual children of, a of Sarah together, right? Together you are set free and made his children and his heirs. And that idea of the inheritance beginning in the spirit comes out. And then that final theme was like Christ in me, a new creation. And we saw that like in this idea of living by the spirit, not by the flesh, but by love and in how God brings out the fruit of the spirit when we live by the spirit. And so across the book, you know, we, we see that progression from this is how it works to this is what it means for your life and how you live. Thoughts, comments? It wasn't very elegant on my technology here, but I kind of like that it's all up here. <laughs> Got it done. Yeah. So, yeah, the, this idea is, um, we, and then, you know, 
along the way, we did see some interesting things about how the scripture works, right? How the Old Testament, it says, prophesied or uh, preached the gospel in advance, right? This idea that that way back in Abraham, God's plan was started has been consistent all along so that when we see the old testament living to pointing to jesus we're seeing the truth of it and that that is a good way to look at the old testament that's how paul looked at the old testament and how jesus said it worked he said the scriptures testify about me so we also saw that along the way we saw that our um, identity has to be a people of of god and how we really are supposed to be unified ethnically um, across rich and poor, male and female, how that really is supposed to be the church together. And we know the church has a long way to go on that. It's good to think about how important that unity is to the theology that we see in scripture. Anything else stand out to you? I've really enjoyed studying this book. It's a challenging book, but I loved seeing how it all came together, how our works matter as we live in community um, together, and how all of it happens in the power of the Spirit. And the Spirit um, leads us to reap the goodness of God's way of life. So thank you all. I appreciate it. I want to show you what we're doing next. Uh, let's see. How do I do that? New share. Um, hmm. I have... Probably unshare and then share again. I can do a new one. I just forgot to like... Um, put it up here to start with. So let me do that. It's um, smarter than I am. There we go. Now I can do it. This is what we're doing next. Um, the series is called Daniel, Hope for the Faithful. And we're gonna do the same format, Tuesday mid-morning um, in person and on Zoom and Wednesday evenings. Um, I had some people talk about maybe moving it, but it didn't sound like, um, seemed like this is working and we're gonna keep it. So um, we'll start January 11th uh, for Tuesday and 12th for Wednesday night. Um, and it'll be this will be a neat study. Now Daniel is very interesting. It starts out with stories and it ends with these bizarre apocalyptic visions and they all tie together and they all point to God's sovereignty and how it can bring us hope. So I'm very excited about it and I hope you'll plan to join. Right. All right. Any other comments before we switch to prayer time? Okay, I'm going to stop the recording.